Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ryan Keating. Today we're backstage at the Samuel Beckett Theater where the current revival of End Games has just opened. We're delighted to have an opportunity to talk to the star and director, Alvin Epstein. Thank you for stopping by today. It's no, I admire no, you work. stopped by. Thank <laughs> you for stopping by. We're in my dressing room. <laughs> well, we appreciate your time. Uh, when this first opened um, back in 1958, I believe, the um, New York Times called it a non-representational drama. Yeah. How did you perceive it when you first auditioned for it back in 57? I don't think I auditioned for it. Uh, and I, I don't know, I don't remember what my perception was. No, because I had been in Waiting for Godot mm -hmm. uh, in 56, the original production. And so I was already sort of, um, I was associated with Beckett. And uh, I was offered the part on the basis of that previous performance. So I never auditioned. I'm not even, I, and I haven't got the vaguest memory. I think they they were right then. It's a non-representational drama, and it still is. What were your first perceptions of it when you read it? I don't remember. No. It was too long ago. <laughs> and uh, what's more, I think you know, there's the, the thing that really wipes out a memory is doing it again. Mm -hmm. Having done it now. I don't really remember what I thought about it or felt about it then. I didn't have a very clear memory of it when we began rehearsals of this, and now there's none left at all. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you had played Clove in the original production, yeah. and now you're yeah. playing Ham. Yeah. Uh, do you find that you are possessive of Peter Evans because you originated this role here? No, or? not at all. Uh, I may have been a little bit... I mean, I, you know, you, you never can really measure those mm -hmm. things. I thought that... Uh, that my feelings about the play now were fresh and new when we started rehearsal, and uh, I wasn't aware particularly. I mean, obviously, I have you know I have ideas about the play, and uh, and I was directing it, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that I was trying to direct Peter in any sense to give my performance of it. And you know, if I had been acting that part again myself, I doubt very much that I would have wanted to repeat anything that I could remember. Mm -hmm. You had said about. He's um, supposed to be older and wiser. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he had a spirit in melancholy, and that's why you wanted to do it with him. Yeah. How would you describe the relationship between Ham and Clove? It's very hard to describe it, <laughs> because I think it's so... Uh, it's... It's the relationship uh, on, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll just give you all the, the, the formulas, you know, mm -hmm. I can spout them because they're not hard to spout and they've been spouted by a thousand other people. Uh, it, it's master and slave, um, it's father and son, it's uh, employer, employee, um, it's uh, ego and id, <laughs> and I think it's also, in a way, although they're two men and they are possibly father and son, it's also it reflects husband and wife. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a married couple. In other words, it's it's none of those and all of them. It, it's any. It, it's a very close personal relationship between two people who have lived very close to each other and very alone with each other for a very long time. And they've both assumed roles within the relationship that probably limit them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, may maybe in, in their fantasies they could easily change places. But because there's... Uh, the, re the relationship is so routine, it's become such a, uh, a habitual and almost, uh, you know, programmed thing in each of them. They obey their roles. They perform their roles for and with each other. Uh, in, the, in the same way that, uh, that people in a family do. You know, you, you, sometimes you feel, oh, I don't want to be this way. Why am I being this way? Because it's the only way I know how to be with that person, or the way you, the only way you think you know how to be. In the end, do you find it a positive uh, play? Well, I'm I'm told very often by people who see it and and like it very much that it's oh God, it's so depressing and it's so despairing, and of course they're laughing. 
through most of it, <laughs> or through a good deal of it anyway. Uh, and uh, and I don't. No, I don't feel that way about it at all. Uh, I, w I I don't feel any more. What what was the word you said? Positive. Uh, well, I don't feel more positive or negative about it than I do about li my life, because I feel that in many ways it reflects my life. Mm -hmm. There's there's good in it and there's bad, and if you want to say that it's a ve it's a very bleak life that these people lead, and it's very enclosed and cut off from other people, mm -hmm. uh, and in a way, I guess it's almost like prison in that sense. Uh, that doesn't exactly reflect everything in my life, but it certainly reflects ways that I feel about my life and ways that I think we all feel about life in this century. Uh, presumably, the, the people in the play are the last four people in the world, as far as they know. I mean, it's Clove and Ham, and then Clo uh, Ham's parents, Nell and Nag. And uh, they don't know that anybody else is alive out there. And they think probably there isn't. Uh, and that uh, kind of threat of, uh, the, of possible universal extinction is also something that we live with quite normally and from day to day. Mm -hmm. Nothing unusual. Well, there's certain, certainly a lot to be learned from his work. Um, you had been directed by Alan Schneider in the original production. Yeah. Uh, who is, is said to have been a terror to work under. How did you find your relationship changed with him over the years? Uh, well, uh, Alan had a reputation of being a terror to work with, but not only. If he, had, if he was exclusively a terror, nobody would want to work with him. <laughs> Lots of people did. He had his moments, and uh, he had his one big moment with me, and... Uh, I'm sure that we both decided, uh, you know, m me a little bit later, maybe he on the spot decided, well, I'll never work with that actor again. <laughs> and I think I must have decided uh, about, uh, when, when I came to six months later, uh -huh. uh, well, I'll never work with him again, but I don't have to worry about that because he's not going to want to work with me again. And then we, did, then we did work again together very shortly afterward because he then directed uh, Waiting for the Dough on television, the television production. And uh, and I think we, we worked, uh, let's say, well and uneventfully that time. And that was mainly because he was being a holy terror with somebody else in the <laughs> cast, not me. Uh, and then, although we saw each other through the years, uh, we never worked again together until last year when he asked me to come into the Beckett Place, which had already opened, and I was replacing an actor. And, uh, and we had, uh, it was our first meeting over a work situation in uh -huh. something like a quarter of a century. <laughs> and it was a little bit fraught. And when he called me, we, had, we still hadn't seen each other. I had uh, agreed to do the plays and uh, on the telephone with, with the producer and with casting people. And then uh, Alan called me to make an appointment for the first rehearsal. And uh, he told me how glad he was that I was doing it, and I told him how glad I was that I was doing it. And then we said, yeah, uh, so we'll meet, you know, Thursday mm -hmm. at 4. And uh, then he said, oh, by the way, Alvin, uh, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm, uh, I've mellowed a lot. <laughs> I'm still crazy, but I've mellowed. Uh, and I said, well, Alan, I'm really glad to hear it. And if I was crazy, then I think I must have mellowed, too. <laughs> and we had no, tr we had only good, good rapport and good work together. And it was particularly terrific because we had a background, you know, way, way back of this antagonism, and then we didn't mm -hmm. have it anymore, and that was very nice. Well, it's nice to know people grow up <laughs> after yeah. a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how would you compare your direction to his of Endgame? Endgame. Game. One. One Endgame. Uh, although lots of games are played in the play Endgame. <coughs> well... I can't really be too objective about that uh, because I'm in the play. Mm -hmm. I know that it, it... I think that we were totally different people and therefore our uh, approach to it has to be very different. And certainly I can't think for a moment that uh, my production of Endgame would be anything like Alan's production of Endgame except for 
one thing, and it's probably the most important thing. It's that I think we both, that, that Alan, in a way, taught me to trust and respect Beckett's writing. Mm -hmm. uh, almost totally. Uh, when I, I, I should say totally, it's not almost totally. Um, which doesn't mean that you don't sometimes take liberties, because, I mean, in order to perform anything, it's immediately you're looking for liberty within the framework of the piece. Um, but I tried uh, very much to just perform and direct Beckett's play the way he wants it, the way he, the way he envisioned it. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, obviously, nobody can do that, and it's a good thing, too, because nobody gets into his head and into his soul except through your own head and your own soul. So it's my vision of his vision, and Alan's was his vision of Beckett's vision. But there's a, I, I tried to put nothing, no filters, no, and no, no artificial gimmickry and no, no uh -huh. point of view, no conceptualizing on top of Beckett's play. And many people do that, and it's uh, presumably a respectable thing to do, and it's certainly it's a, it's, it's a thing that has to be done sometimes to uh, plays of authors who we've seen too much, you know, and, and we, need, we, we, need, right. we need to shake ourselves up and we need to shake the play up in order to, in order to see it fresh. We don't have to do that with Samuel Beckett. He's sitting there right alongside mm -hmm. of us. He's not an old fogey from another <laughs> age. Uh, you had grown up in New York, and you had enlisted in World War II. Not uh, enlisted, I was drafted. Drafted. How did, the, uh, <laughs> how did the, uh, your experiences with the war change your perception of humanity? Because I know a lot of people that I know, my father included, who were in the war, say they never saw the world the same way again. Did it make you want to aspire to your art? Well, I mean, boy, you're really popping a... That's a that's a tough question. I should have the rest of the 28 <laughs> minutes to think about it before answering it. Um, I'm sure it, it must have changed me a great deal, and, and probably uh, it, it might have um, made me feel that there are many things in life that you can do without and a few things in life that you can't do without, mm -hmm. and to separate perhaps a bit of the wheat from the chaff. I don't know which is which, but I think that it's it may perhaps may be more selective and more uh, <laughs> uh, passionate about the things that I care about. And I think it 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 wasn't a. Um, it wasn't a wonderful way to fall in love with humanity. Um, I'm sure that the war brought out the best in a lot of people, mm -hmm. but life in the army was not a way to love your fellow man. I mean, it, it, it gave you a sense of uh, privacy and how to hold yourself aloof and distant from people so that you wouldn't feel like killing them. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> well, after the war, how were you, you able to come to terms with that? Because you were an artist, and certainly that's to bring joy to people and enlighten them. Well, I mean, if, if it did affect me in that sense, I think it was unconscious. I, I wasn't aware of it. Um, I don't really know what to tell you about that. I mean, it's an interesting question, and I'd have to think about it. Next time we talk, <laughs> okay. I'll try to maybe have an answer for you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There was an Edward Gordon Craig who was very influential on your decision to go into theater. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you elaborate a little on that? Uh, well, Craig was... He was a one, one of those rare beasts... Uh, a man of ideas and theory and practicality too. He was a man who was born into the theater. He was he was born into a trunk. Mm -hmm. He was an actor when he was a tot, and uh, and uh, kept on acting all through his youth. 
and um, and was always acting in the greatest companies of his time, with the greatest actors of his time. And his time was, he was born in 1872 in England, and he was the son of England's greatest actress of the period, Ellen Terry. And Ellen Terry acted with the greatest actor of the period, Sir Henry Irving, in his company. And so uh, that was uh, Craig's background and his... Um, his experience as a, as a young man. And then, I don't know, sometime in his... Uh, I, it must have been growing dissatisfaction, but somewhere along the mid-twenties, I think, or early twenties, he decided, this is all not for me. <laughs> you know, and he threw it all over mm -hmm. and uh, went roaring off to, uh, to the continent. Uh, and there was still a very big difference between life in England at the time, which was still very... Victorian, very Edwardian, and very constricted, and uh, and life that was exploding on the continent, and uh, with you know what people in, certainly in England they would call bohemianism, bohemianism, <laughs> uh, and uh, and that's where he really he changed his whole life, and he became a leader of an enormous movement of change in the theater, um, and. Uh, he was a, a great designer as well. He revolutionized the way people thought of stage design. And although he wasn't the only one of the period, obviously the, the, the theater and, and Western civilization was rife, ripe for that. Um, uh, he was certainly one of the leaders and uh, and maybe if he hadn't really, if he had never existed, uh, perhaps the movement would never have found another uh, sort of core, a center, a heart, as it did in his work. And uh, a lot of uh, later work in, in the American theater and the urban theater never could have happened without him. Uh, he continued to do work in the in the professional theater, but it was always very stormy and very unsuccessful because the professional theater was so uh, constantly tied to the very things that he was mm -hmm. running away from uh, that it, it made for a lot of trouble. And he had he designed a production for Eleanor Duza that made him tear his hair and, and scream at her and break everything asunder. He designed a production for Stanislavski in Moscow of uh, Hamlet and that one, I think, went off pretty well, except that they had their problems, mm -hmm. too. Uh, well, I'm telling you too much about Edward Burton Craig. What do you want to know? <laughs> uh, how he influenced you? <laughs> well, he influenced me in, in every way. I mean, I really, uh, when, when I was a young man, I should say, I wasn't a young actor and I wasn't a young director. I was young nothing. I was just a young man, wait, you know, waiting to find a theater that I would want to work in. Uh, nothing in the commercial theater here appealed to me at all. And the only thing that I could find that really stimulated my... No, my imagination was stimulated, but, but, but that spoke to me that said, ah, this is theater. That was Martha Graham. It was Martha Graham's theater. Because as much as... I mean, we, we, we think of her today as a dancer. Mm -hmm. She was also, and is, an innovator in a whole way of, of, of conceiving of theater Absolutely. as a performance mm -hmm. art. And so I worked with Martha um, for a year. I studied with her uh, back in, I guess, 46, I think it was, as soon as I got out of the Army. Well, you'd also studied mime in France. Not yet. It was, I, I worked with Martha before. Right. And after a year of that, I realized that uh, I did not want to be a dancer and that if I continue studying with her, that I would become a dancer or or a failed dancer. <laughs> so uh, it was time for me to leave and to look for something else. And I, I already knew uh, Gordon Craig at that point. And I went to Paris to um, let him guide me into the next phase of work, which mm -hmm. he did. He sent me to Etienne de Croux, who was uh, a great innovator in pantomime which he called mime, and is mime. Um, and I stayed with the crew for four years, studying with him, and I joined his company and performed with him. 
And then at the end of that time, I then realized again it's time to move on it because I really I was aiming toward the theater all the time. By that time, the American theater had uh, begun to change. There was there was an off Broadway movement, and there was more experimentation. There were more daring and more interesting productions, less form formula kind of theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I still wasn't really ready. I, I wasn't happy with what I saw here particularly. I came back and I studied for a year with Sanford Meisner. I wanted to study the, the, the method, the Stanislavski method. And Sandy was teaching at the um, neighborhood playhouse. I did not join the school, but I joined his professional class. And I studied with him for a year, and then I went off to uh, Israel to join the Habima Theater. I was there for three years. And at the end of that time, I thought, well, now it's time to come home and really just make an American actor out of myself and see if the theater is really there. And it was when I came home. There was a lot of very interesting stuff going on, and I worked in the American theater ever since then. Well, you had your uh, major New York debut with Marcel Marceau, yeah. which came about by accident. Yeah. Well, uh, his, act his first engagement here was sort of an accident. Uh, Marceau was, I mean, this was, we're talking about 1956, I think. Uh, he and I had been students with De Croo and in De Croo's company together, and we were very good friends, and we lived in the same pension. We had adjoining rooms. We went to school together. We spent a lot of time together. And um, in the, after I had left Paris, he had gone on to become a quite well-known as a young artist in the theater in in France, and also I think he was m very famous in Germany, uh, and probably f getting to be fairly well known elsewhere. But he, he had never been heard of here. And uh, the Stratford, Ontario, festival, Shakespeare festival. You know they have. Uh, sort of a fringe, the way they do in, mm -hmm. in Edinburgh. They have other productions, things that are not only Shakespeare. Uh, and somebody there thought uh, they must have seen Marceau or heard about him, and they brought him to the festival. And uh, a man named Ronald Wilford, uh, who was then uh, a young, aspiring impresario. I mean, he was, he was looking for very interesting artist to uh, produce in the theater. And uh, he went up to uh, to Ontario, and I guess, I, I, I think it was purely by chance that he went and he saw a, pr uh, a performance of Marceau's, and immediately said, I have to bring this man to New York. And he called uh, the Phoenix Theater, which was at that point on uh, 2nd Avenue and 12th Street in what is now the Intermedia Theater. It's right. a big theater, and a very nice theater. And uh, the heads of the Phoenix were then Norris Houghton and T. Edward Hamilton, and uh, they had a regular season. They were one of the, uh, they were very important off-Broadway theater. They were doing very important productions with very important actors, uh, kind of plays that were not getting done on Broadway at the time. And uh, they hadn't begun their season yet. This was, I guess, early fall. And I had just gotten back from Israel, I guess. I must have been late August or early September. And I hadn't lived here in many years, and I began to audition. I wanted to begin to work in the theater. And I was running around auditioning for people. And uh, I saw an ad, I saw an announcement in the paper that Marcel Marceau was coming to New York to perform. And I was very excited because he was a good friend and, you know, how wonderful he's going to be here. So, and I didn't have any money at uh, <laughs> nothing. I was living with my parents. My father was footing the small bill. <laughs> and uh, I told him that uh, Marcel was coming and uh, that we ought to get tickets. So he gave me the money to go down to the box office to buy tickets. Uh, not necessarily for the opening night, because I was going on the same day. It was one of those quickly arranged uh -huh. things, you know, and I, there wasn't much notice. And I, I went down to audition, I remember, at the Rooftop Theater, which was at the foot of 2nd Avenue, for a production of Macbeth. And um, 
I, I gave a very good audition and I was offered any part I wanted, but no, but the only parts that were left were like the second spear carrier and the first gentleman, and I, did, I wasn't sure about that. And the, there wasn't any salary, it was expense money of $25 a week. So I said, well, I'll, let, let me think it over, I'll, let, I'll call you tomorrow. And then I took my cash in my hot little hand mm -hmm. and I walked 12 blocks up <laughs> 2nd Avenue to the box office of the Phoenix Theater to buy the tickets for Marceau, who was opening that night. And when I got up in front of the theater, Norris Houghton, who was a friend of mine, happened to be standing out on the street and saw me and sort of greeted me with open arms. I said, thank God you're here. They've been trying to get in touch with you. Well, get in there, get in there. And I, what are you talking about? He said, they're waiting for you. And I didn't know what he was, I really didn't know what in the world he could mean. And uh, I went into the, they went running into the theater and uh, there was Marceau on stage and they were, oh, thank God you're here. Come <laughs> quick, hurry up. Uh, and I opened that night with Marceau. That was the accident. <laughs> uh, uh, he had, um, he was traveling then with two other people, and they had, uh, they had been in, in Stratford together. And uh, one of them couldn't get a visa to come into the country at sh uh, on such short notice because there was still the McCarran Act, you know, you had a, mm -hmm. it was very hard to get a visa unless you could prove residence for 10 years, I mean, you know, something like that. And uh, so, he suddenly was minus an actor. They had just arrived that day. And uh, he knew that I could do it, and so I was on stage that night with him, and uh, that was the beginning. Well, Alvin, there's so much more I want to ask you, but our time is up, and I know you have a show to do, so we'll have to... Uh, yes, I do. We'll have to sit and chat again. All right. Thanks for taking time out. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank this you. is Ryan Keating, and you've been watching Spotlight. Our guest today has been Alvin Epstein, who is currently starring in the revival of Endgame at the Samuel Beckett Theater. If you have any comments or suggestions, or if you would like to receive our program guide, you can write to myself in care of Piro Productions, 640 10th Avenue, New York, New York, 10036. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating for Spotlight. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank that you. By real quick. Danger fields and other New York night spots. He's a magician whose magic has a twist to it. Welcome, Marco, the X rated magician. Yeah! Yeah! Okay. Yeah! Thank you. Um, I want to tell you right now that, uh, you know, I'm wearing disguise, and, and there is a reason for it because when I go down the street and I walk and talk to you, People call me and say, you know, I've seen that face before. And I tell you, it's a little embarrassing. You don't always have time. But um, I, I guess I'm on stage now. I can take off the disguise and uh, get down to the real magic. Um, some of the things I do are going to be in good taste, and some of the things I do may not be in such good taste. That is not the point of tonight's show. The point is, the magic wand, which I have right here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to make this wand vanish right before your very eyes. Watch carefully. Uh, but before I do that... How many of you would like to see me blow my nose right now? Would anyone like to see me? Yeah! Yeah! Here we go, making a magic wand vanish right before your very eyes. Here we go, on the count of three. One, two, magic wand vanish. Hey, well, where could that magic wand be? I did say this was an X-rated show, so I'm going to show you just where that magic wand is. <laughs> Give me a sec. Oh, excuse me, my balls are in the way. Let's just... Uh, <laughs> and it is, of course, the magic... Wait, that's not my wand. Wait a second. That's fucking... Okay, listen... <laughs> For the first trick, I'm going to need a young lady to help me out, and uh, I see one right here in the audience. Uh, what's your name? <laughs> Come on up. Hi, your name is? Lisa. How you doing, Lisa? I have a lit cigarette coming my way, I believe, right? Lisa, I want you to stand right here to my left. Atta girl. Now, Lisa, do you smoke? Yes. You do smoke. Would you just take a drag on that cigarette? Take a nice, heavy drag. I'm going to hang out here for a little while, and, um, okay... Oh, excuse me, let me just, uh, that. All right. Lisa, I hope you don't mind, but I have to get on my knees for this effect, okay? If you want, you can get on your elbows, but that's another story. Now, what I'm going to do, would you hold this in your left hand, please? I'm going to pull out the bottom section of your 
Oh. Atta girl, she likes it, I can tell. Here we go. And what I'm going to do is take and form a little hole inside the bottom of her shirt. Lisa, with your right hand, would you kindly place a finger inside there? Oh, no, go easy. It's my first time. Go all the way down. Okay? All the way down. That's as far as it goes. Okay, take your finger out. We do have a hole there, am I correct? Oh, yes. We have a lit burning cigarette. I'm going to take the cigarette lit and place it inside the shirt. Now, in a few seconds, you'll see the cigarette fall through her shirt into my hand, at which point it'll be burning the shit out of my hand. I'm going to work fast for that. We'll go on a little more smoke, a little more, pushing it further, further down. Lisa, do you know how to blow? Yeah. Okay, would you... I uh, caught her off guard. There you go. Would you just blow right there? That, okay, right away my hand ends. You'll notice the cigarette has vanished. Lisa, if you're looking for it, you'll find it later when you get undressed. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you. You know, I have one more trick. I'm going to need another young lady from the audience. Lisa, would you like to help me out? Come on back here. Let's give her a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Lisa. So what I have in my possession is uh, um, a box, and you, you notice it is empty. Uh, Lisa also has, um, uh, never mind, let me just go. Uh, um, Lisa, Lisa, what are the color of these pills? What are the color of these pills? No, I didn't ask you what you did to me last night. What are the color of these pills? Blue. Okay, what I'm going to do is tie them into a little knot. Lisa, with your left hand, I want you to hold on real tight, okay? Two silks you hold on to in your left hand, just like so. Now, are you familiar with the magic motion? Okay, well, extend your arm out a little bit, and uh, this way you gotta hold it, and drop your arm down. Bring it up, down, up, uh, down. <laughs> you know, I'm not ready. I so. Now, Lisa, I want you to do everything I do, okay? I'm gonna rub my box. Please do the same. My box, my box, my box. My box. Okay, now a little magic motion over that box, and from within that box comes an orange silk. I'm going to take it and place it.